Hello and welcome to the Society with Fatma Shaheen at PTB World. Today on our show, we'll be talking about a social menace which unfortunately plagues the Pakistani society. We'll be talking about dowry as it has been on a constant rise. Now we understand the fact that this is that one social evil which not only thrives on greed, it is also that one social evil which thrives on gender inequality and economic disempowerment of women. To what extent do we see dowry cases rise? in Pakistan over a period of time and what reasons can we attribute to the same this is something upon which we'll be shedding light also we'll be talking about how gender inequality at a very core and basic level perpetuates dowry related abuse in this regard we'll also be delving upon the fact that when we do talk about laws when we do talk about policies to what extent have laws and policies addressed dowry related violence uh, moving on we'll also be shedding light upon the fact that whereas we all understand the fact that this is something which needs to be looked at from an economic lens too. There is also, of course, a dire need to educate masses, more particularly men and their families too, uh, if we are serious about curbing this very social issue. Uh, in this regard, we'll also be talking about the work of the Punjab government with regards to setting up women protection centers, the aim of which is to provide uh, women who have been survivors of violence, be it because of dowry-related violence or otherwise, with relief and, of course, with justice too. Um, this and much more to follow on today's show, that too with a diverse panel. Let me introduce you to my today's panel. My first panelist for the show today is Ms. Huma Ijaz, who is a legal and policy expert. Assalamu ji and welcome to the show. Alongside her, I have Ms. Rabia Usman, who is a District Women Protection Officer uh, from the Department of Social Welfare, Government of Punjab. Assalamu madam and welcome to the show. Thank you. And my third panelist for the show today is Ms. Mehrunisa Sajjad, who's a social activist. Assalamu alaikum ji, and welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. You're most welcome. I would like to start the show with you, Ms. Huma. Here we must talk about uh, the various instances where we see that just because dowry demands are not met, women are subjected to violence. So in your practice as a lawyer and otherwise, what are the most common uh, dowry demands that people do make uh, to women? Okay. Uh, interestingly, there is a law called the Dowry Restriction Act of 1976. Hmm. And it does restrict asking of dowry or giving of dowry. And hmm. it's like, uh, it's ridiculous amounts, like 1,000 rupees or 500 or uh, 5,000 rupees, but those amounts can be revised. Hmm. So there is a law there already, hmm. which does impose restrictions on giving or demanding dowry, and it has penalties, which is up to six months or more of imprisonment and hmm. fines for those who uh, violate the law, especially right. those who demand a uh, dowry. Yeah. And then there is also, uh, there was a criminal uh, amendment act uh, in which they, it was women related, mm -hmm. violence related offenses, dowry being one of them. Right. Violence against women, if you know, dowry is demanded from them and they're sent back to their homes mm -hmm. demanding and you know, doing all this uh, kind of exploitation of mm -hmm. women. However, it's a social evil. Right. Yes, uh, you can uh, probably go and complain. Mm. Uh, there is a law there, but nobody goes and complains. Very mm. few people ever have complained. Mm. So in my practice, what has happened that a lot of people don't come for dowry-related offenses. They usually come for non-payment of dower-related offenses. Right. right, your point is noted. On which I'll come to you, Ms. Rabia. Here we talk about your work too. And in this regard, we understand the fact that you're heading uh, this Women Protection Center in Lahore, the purpose of which is, of course, to provide not only support, but also to provide rehabilitative services to women who do reach out to you. So for the clarification of the audience, could you please tell us that practically, how does this center work? Crisis Center are specially formed institutions to provide free of cost services to women victims of violence. All the services are being provided free of cost by the state and uh, these include uh, like conflict resolution, mediation, uh, psychosocial counseling, family therapies, um, legal advice, legal mm. guidance and completely free legal aid. It right. is one of the only institutions which is providing completely free legal aid to women. What exactly comes within the domain of all these services? Is it just limited to legal aid services or does it also include uh, psychological counselling or given all those women out there shelter to? Uh, crisis centres are like a one-stop shop. Hmm. We cater to all the problems which women face during the phases of violence. Hmm. Uh, it can be psychosocial counselling, psychological uh, treatment, referrals, referrals for shelter, hmm or um, legal aid, legal guidance, whatever the need of the woman is, we are supposed to take care of it and we do it 
with uh, help of other institutions also. On which I'll come to you, Ms. Meronisa. Here we must also, of course, talk about not one, rather various challenges that girls often do face because of the fact that they can't keep up to the dowry-related demands. So in your viewpoint, looking at this from a social viewpoint, how does uh, the inability to comply with various dowry demands impact a woman with regards to her personal growth, with regards to her career advancement, or even with regards to her health? Um, I think all of this is very intelligent. Linked. So you, child marriage is inextricably linked mm -hmm. to dowry-related violence. And the reason for this is, number one, um, because ch uh, parents of daughters, they feel like when we need to get them married off, we have to pay a large sum for dowry. Mm. So that means that they do not invest in the girl's education right. or in her career development or mm. on making her economically independent. Mm. But that focus goes on starting to collect gifts as right. soon as she is born mm. with the expectation that we will have to pay this to the family that she's getting married into at a later stage. Mm. The second thing is that the younger a girl is, the lesser the dowry sum or the lesser dowry she has to pay. Right. So there's an incentive for families to, to get, get their married daughters soon. married off mm -hmm. at a younger age. And another thing which is very interesting is that um, even in cities and especially in rural areas, the way that a dowry is calculated is that every year of formal education that a girl receives, it actually increases the dowry that her family is expected to pay. Mm. And all of this has a huge impact um, on everything. And I mean, just to add to something that Homa said, mm. we have the Dowry and Bridal Gifts Restriction Act of uh, 1967, but this is a federal law. 1976. Uh, 1976. Mm. But this is a federal law. After the 18th Amendment, right. this became a provincial subject. Right. I would want you to comment on the laws, but before that, we need to understand the fact that when we do talk about this socially well it needs to be talked about more from the social lens as opposed to the legal lens yeah. and this is something on which you very rightly so uh, comprehensively detailed us too but Ms. Huma, when we talk about the law in addition to this 1976 act if somebody has been tortured with regards to not being able to give in the right amount of dowry or for that matter any reason because of which you know they have been abused then can they seek criminal prosecution yes. because yes, this sir. is a very relevant issue and yes. we have seen many women they've lost their lives they've committed suicide, they've been burned just because they can't meet to the demands of yes, their husband's yes. dowry. There was this Criminal Amendment Act back in 2005, I mm. think, if I'm correct. Yes, it was. It's uh, And in that, you can uh, file an FIR against any kind of violence, which right. is due to any reason. You don't have to give a reason. It's any kind of violence, dowry being one of them, demand of dowry being one of them, mm. in which they're tortured or they're sent back or their kids are taken and they are... And though uh, socially, uh, socially this is more expected from the lower strata, right? Um, if I uh, may say, and they say no, the upper strata, but upper strata also it's uh, happening in a different manner. Hmm. It is there, it is in different manner. For example, I have families who approach me and they say the reason the marriage is uh, now dissolving is because they're expecting that we support the right. children. Mm. And uh, because her husband is not mm. doing much, and they then expect that we support the business of the husband. So, if to say in the poor strata, it is on a very menial level. Mm. Or oh, give me a motorcycle, or give me this, Some and go and get or, yeah, or right. go and get mm. this, uh, or go and get land from your parents. Mm -hmm. In the in the more uh, middle class, upper middle class, it is it is all about how much you're going to give support to our son. Right. And there are families who, who do not have, but it is all there to say that it does not exist. Exactly. In addition to that, I, I think that's a very valid point made by yourself. But when we do talk about the trends changing, we do see that there was this time when dowry was considered to be a symbolic gesture. But now it is more of a materialistic expectation. And this is not something that we see in South Asian countries. This is also something that we see in perhaps part of Africa, in East Asian countries, to and then also Arab culture as well. So overall, how do you see these demands changing in different status of the Pakistani society? Uh, these demands have changed in a different manner. They are expecting that there will be support hmm. to the family, the boy's family or the boy hmm. from the, for example, if the girl's father is a businessman, hmm. he will be supporting the business of that 
son-in-law hmm. and it's expected right and if it doesn't happen then there are issues hmm. and by the way recently there was also a very good play on one of the TVs that I was right. watching and it was all about that it is very it is no, no longer the way it used to be that a list used to come and you're expected or oh, you're going to give all the house hmm. appliances and you're going to give electronics and everything that expectation is still there hmm. but now it has taken a different coverage and with the poor hmm. we all know that they expect that the entire house appliances need to come in and this and that mm -hmm. and th that's all there is a, it's a social uh, exploitation which is happening so mm -hmm. the the with that I think the solution will rather than being more legal is mm -hmm. going to be more social right if you socially denounce it if people start refusing this mm -hmm. people do not give in to the pressure mm -hmm. no matter what it should not be like if people are such mm -hmm. people should think why are you giving your daughter to such family already? that's right but then the solutions oh. also emanate from the society and yes. here Ms. Rabia I would want you to comment on this further so if hypothetically speaking a woman comes to your center and she complains that she has been tortured what are the remedies that the center is offering to them uh, be it in terms of giving them perhaps a protection order a residence order a monetary order so what is it that you do to help that woman out the recent uh, notification of this Punjab protection of women against violence act has strengthened us in mm. these terms uh, domestic violence has been brought into the criminal justice system right so it's uh, like uh, a punishable crime in easy words and people just can't say it's an internal matter of the house, it's a family matter. Mm. So if the woman is undergoing violence in her safe space, uh, that is also uh, a reason that the perpetrator can be brought into justice. So the woman comes to us if she's beaten physically or she's going through torture mentally or going through economic abuse. Mm. So we now have a specific law under which we can provide her help. And as per the law, I understand that people like yourself, that is mm. a women protection officers, they also have that right to actually go into the premises if they find out that somebody is being physically abused. That is so one have major kind of change, of, right? Which is, which and is we very feel really good about because it. Because a lot of times yes. women can't reach out to you. Yes. So have you ever exercised that power being a protection officer? We yourself? have recently been notified, and we are uh, like in the process of setting up the system. But we have been receiving complaints, mm -hmm. and but we do need the consent of the. Right. Uh, person who is being victimized. Hmm. So that is also an important thing that the person has to file complaint or send us a message through uh, someone. So, but this has really strengthened our services. We could never just rescue hmm. a woman under uh, going through violence. Right, Ms. Rabia, on which I'll come to you. Hey, we must also, of course, talk about the impact of a dowry demands not being met on the generations, rather the intergenerational impact as it does have on different families. So as a social activist, uh, what do you believe are the most pressing impacts it so may have on the family socially as well as economically because in families who actually do propagate such practices we do see that this is something which then transcends from one family from one generation to the other. I think one of the main ways that it impacts them and puts them in a negative cycle is that a lot of families take huge debts or loans mm. when they are getting their daughters married. What this does it 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 traps them in crippling debt, which right. they spend the rest of their lives and perhaps for generations trying to mm. pay off. And that affects their upward socio-economic mobility. Mm. So without being able to pay off that debt, they are constantly stuck in trying to you know, pay interest payments on that debt, etc. So it affects them like this. And another way is that when you are bringing up your daughters with this expectation that they're, they're a burden on you, um, and you know, you it's a transaction, you are dehumanizing women, mm. and I think that they internalize, and perhaps when they're bringing up their daughters, that is something that they will also teach them. Mm. And another way that you are validating men and telling them that this is an okay expectation to have, it's mm. completely normal. If you're marrying someone, you should expect mm. their fam uh, the girl's family to meet any demands and that you are And then we making. also observe the fact that this is the norm which kind of travels then from one generation to the other Absolutely. because this is something unfortunately which you kind of inherent then yes Yes. On which I'll come to you, Ms. Uh, Homa. Here we must talk about the very imperative role of media too. Now we have seen that the UN women, I remember a few years ago, started this very interesting campaign of which a lot of celebrities actually became a part, men particularly, I remember, and they very actively condemned the practice of dowry. So what role can media play here in this regard so as to challenge such practices rather than validating them? Uh, and lately I've seen that uh, a lot of our population, not here, all over the world, watches these plays mm. uh, on all the TV channels, they're all very good. Mm. So I think that is a very powerful medium. 
Hmm. It actually people are taking out time. They're watching each one of them on YouTube or on the channels themselves. So that is powerful medium because I've seen some dowry related plays and they were very impactful. Hmm. Because uh, one is that. Hmm. Secondly, you do it through advertisements. Hmm. I've seen that now they have started developing these advertisements where I'm saving up, I'm taking insurance, but not for her marriage, for her education. Hmm. So the thing is marriage itself should become a more simpler affair. And I've seen also that what uh, celebrities can do and also promote, you know, simpler weddings. Right. You know, those uh, great opulent weddings like a royal family, hmm. nobody needs it. So if you start, uh, you know, on your TV and all that, you or simpler weddings, which are more uh, family oriented which are more that would really promote again you know the demands mm. the expectations right. and everything because, because it's a big big expectation exactly feeding uh, mm. 500 people and in kpk mm. i remember mm. a few years ago there was also this law which very categorically mm. said that we have to ensure that the marriage expenditure it is also regulated that way here she's raised some very valid points on which i would want you to deliberate further now we also see other than celebrities a lot of average pakistani women out there too they also also make this conscious decision not to have very extravagant weddings and because they don't have those extravagant weddings they also don't want an extravagant amount of dowry but at the same time we also mm. see that their families or their prospective husbands they might judge them for this they might be discriminated because of this so in a society which doesn't per se or at least certain quarters of the society which doesn't uh, kind of condemn dowry practices how then can we expect women to take that initiative to say no I think this is deeply embedded in our society, in our cultural practices, the demand of the unsaid expectation that the bride is going to bring dowry. Hmm. And a lot of work needs to be done in terms of awareness. Women, especially the mothers, should take stand. Hmm. The women themselves, the girls themselves should take stand. And a major role needs to be played by the mothers of the boys. Hmm. They have to uh, stop this culture of demanding dowry and they have to respect the person they are bringing into their families. Right. But here I also understand that part of your work is also to actually mediate and arbitrate between couples. So if, hypothetically speaking, a couple comes to you and they have this kind of an issue amongst them, would you take that lead of counselling them and telling them all that you're saying now? Tell mm -hmm. them that dowry has no place in our religion. It has no religious background mm -hmm. and it has no place in our legal system. Mm -hmm. So this is just the influence of our neighbouring countries which mm -hmm. has uh, come into our uh, like uh, everyday uh, doings from the right. past so many years. Mm -hmm. So the people who have a um, who are educated mm. and who have the will to live a better life, mm. a better life, a better marital life, mm. they have a lot of effect of our counselling. Like right. in one or two sessions they are done, they move forward mm. and with a positive impact in their lives. But you also on the converse yes. say, this is something that you told me earlier, that there are a lot of dowry related cases which are coming to people like yourself because violence as we all know is something which is very wide. They can be acid attacks, they can be honour crimes, they can be violence in different forms. Um, but dowry related Related claims. They that are is mostly somehow related to the uh, socio-economic class system, hmm. because I have seen women uh, dying due to domestic violence, which is being put on them due to less hmm. dowry. Hmm. Women come back; they are badly beaten up. They are being thrown out of their houses with their children, with the demands to bring more dowry. Hmm. It is such a stigma in our society and hmm. women are suffering in such a major form, they're losing their lives. It's a never-ending menace, unfortunately. Yes. And basically. that is now more common in the lower socioeconomic strata right. of the society. To which you wanted to add something. They are yes. also expecting, hmm. you ask your father to give us a house, hmm. an apartment. The type down. of violence varies. The upper middle class might not they, beat the her blue is and black. It's emotional, it's verbal. It's called financial violence. It's economic yeah, abuse. Economic, economic abuse. abuse. And they're doing, it, and they're doing it very systematically, yes. by right. the way. And a lot of uh, marriages are ending because of or this. are in misery mm. because of this. Exactly. They are. On which I'll come to you, Ms. Meronisa. Here we must also talk about the role of the education system. Now, a lot of times we see that the education system should be such idly, which doesn't inculcate or in any way promote gender biases. So when we look at it from a reformatory viewpoint, what are the changes you feel we need to do in our education system, uh, be it with regards to improving the curriculum or for that matter investing in teacher training so as to address this particular issue? Um, so I think we need to 
reform our education system to incorporate life skills based education more and of mm. course for a girl that's different for men that's different we need to educate our boys that and we need to tell them that actually in our religion there is no space for dowry mm. the husband is supposed to maintain the wife and the children this right. is something i don't know why it's been reversed but in fact the concept of dower haq meher in islam mm. is you pay the women a matrimonial right. gift and i'll and tell you something very interesting here so i was going over this report which actually suggested that there are parts in africa where it is the man that is the groom who's paying the bride basically absolutely. dowry for her to get married to him because historically so you are south asian culture where yeah. the tables have turned yeah mm. and you you know this reversal can be trace back to before the roman um, era also ancient because ancient roman times ancient roman times because the idea was that you are compensating the bride's family for loss of labor over the, there like all your children worked on the land right, right in old times and also for loss of reproductive potential mm. so essentially even the concept of maintenance in islam comes from that that mm. the woman is giving you know you repro reproducing for the man right so i don't know where because of other cultural influences perhaps that has seeped into muslim culture and it's very unfortunate right. because that is not something that our religion preaches right. actually even in the torah it mm. is the husband's family mm. um that is supposed to pay uh the bride's family right. uh, during marriage so i mean our education system needs to highlight mm. the religious rights that a woman has and, and hey, spread awareness and religious leaders they also have a very important role Absolutely. to play because Absolutely. we have been following religious leaders and those so many other things yeah. like in times of covid-19 i remember they were at the forefront so as to endorse the covid-19 vaccination and positive messaging and from them exactly. can really reach people and i think also making higher education and education more accessible for women right. so understanding that a lot of women Uh, don't have mobility for example and having more options to continue mm. um college studies or higher education from home mm. also making sure that a lot of universities are coeducation and in our culture it might make some families uncomfortable perhaps or husbands right. uncomfortable sending women there or women themselves might not want to right. so making more all girls institutions also to facilitate and make sure that you're placing women at the center and making them comfortable right miss meronis on which i'll come to you miss homa here we must also talk about the lessons pakistan and pakistani laws and society can learn with regards to different societies and the laws that we do see being applied in different countries uh, to name a few examples here we understand the fact that in bangladesh particularly there have been specialized tribunals which have been established so as to look after dowry related cases and by that same yardstick we also see that in countries like nigeria dowry related violence has been particularly penalized so what lessons at the end of the day can pakistan and the pakistani legal system learn looking at different jurisdictions i would add another jurisdiction right. which is actually a neighboring country mm. there what they have done they have similar kind of laws you know mm. dowry restriction law but their laws are very well developed that way what they have done is it's a, uh, in other countries and we should follow that that it becomes a crime the uh, the uh, groom, groom family can actually sue them for damages mm. and when you sue them for damages then they can recover a lot from them depending upon the status of the groom family mm. if the groom family has a lot of money you can sue them for more damages and they are mm. recoverable right. and in those courts they have been recoverable so this is one thing which is we can learn from and actually develop mm. and tribunals we don't need tribunals we already have family courts mm. we can probably add uh, we've already always discussed this i think on various shows that we need to have more judges and more uh, mm. uh, building allocated only to family related cases right. so you can take them all you can take them in either civil court damages and you can also uh, instead of civil court you can take them to the family court right. and you can uh, use it as damages against such a family or you can set up special tribunals hmm. because this is happening as i said systematically hmm. through economic abuse through uh, domestic abuse through other other things yeah. also we could look at middle east right how are they taking dowry there because as we were discussing just before the show that in middle east actually uh, the groom has uh, family has to prepare a whole home for the woman hmm. before they bring in a woman according to their status right. they have to provide for everything for her to just come and and plank herself there and start a home on which i'll come to you ms rabia here we must talk about the pakistani state's international obligations too and here in this regard we understand the fact that pakistan has ratified cedaw it has also ratified the udhr and then uh, stg 5 particularly talks about a calling for the elimination 
eradication of harmful practices such as dowry. To what extent do you see all these ratifications, all these obligations being translated into our laws? I think Pakistani women are benefiting from this ratification mm -hmm. and SDG 5. We, have, we can see uh, commissions on the status of women in the federal government, in the provincial governments. We have uh, quotas for employment. We have special legislations being made and uh, NGOs and other bodies are helping us in the implementation. Uh, so the ordinary Pakistani woman is actually benefiting from the ratification of SIDA and SDG 5 and quite a lot of work is being done speedily in this regard. Right. I see government departments working on it, the Women Development Department, they have this uh, Punjab Commission on the Status of Women mm. and they have that 1043 helpline which is doing a wonderful job and the police is working on the women tahafuz markers and mm. they are doing an excellent job, it's a recent initiative. Right. Similarly, the and social we also have the Federal Ombudsperson for yes, Harassment Against yes. Women. Basically. Harassment and the mm. property related cases. Right. So women are being uh, facilitated and the main drive behind this are these international conventions which the Pakistani government has signed. Right. But you see, then again, this is also a question of accessibility. We do understand the fact that centers like these exist, but what about the women out there who belong to rural areas of the country? Yes. How can they access people like yourself? Because a lot of times we see that all these issues, all these crimes, they actually are committed in the rural population as opposed to the urban cities. We're raising awareness on the services hmm. and uh, informing the public and orientating them about their rights and responsibilities hmm. is a major task and the government alone cannot perform this. So we need help from uh, the civil society organizations and public-private hmm. partnerships which can particularly work in different areas of Punjab and Pakistan for extensive outreach, right, for the trickle down effect, right. So we and need here collaboration on that. would yes. then be amongst all the stakeholders, yes. be it government, government departments, civil society, and then even the community, because you have to bridge that gap between the masses and the yes. work that is being done by the government. Yes. On which I'll come to you, uh, Ms. Mehrunisa. Here we must talk about the need to upgrade uh, the laws and policies because the law, as we understand, exists in 1976. So here, do you not feel then that we need to basically update our strategy? sticks to more data research so as to be able to policies which better reflect changing times. Yeah, um, and also that law, I mean, Sindh and Punjab have not passed any legislation to right. curb this. Uh, we know Balochistan in 1981 passed rules um, according to which dowry gifts exceeding the minimum, uh, the maximum lim limit prescribed can be seized. Mm. KPK, I think, in 2018 passed a law. Sindh, there was a bill, it wasn't. I think Sindh and Punjab need to pass provincial legislation to curb this because we know that in Balochistan in 1985 there were rules which were devised according mm. to which any dowry gift that exceeds the minimum limit can be seized. Mm. In KPK in 2018 they passed another law. In Sindh and Punjab there have been bills but this has not been passed. Another thing, data collection is very important. Right. To know what is happening, what abuse it's leading to so that it's mm. mapped out in those areas, those lacunas in the law mm. can be identified. Also, I think it's very important to have financial literacy campaigns for women and also right. ensure inheritance, that mm. women are given their inheritance because what happens is here when families are marrying off their daughters, they think that's it. We've right. paid them the dowry, we've given them some gold. It's okay we are done to deprive with them. them of the inheritance. Yes. And right. we see this mm. very normalized. Exactly. And this is something that we need to educate our women about. That and this is very important because you see at the end of the day, if you're economically empowering a woman, yeah. then you're giving her that strength to say to no to Dowry abuse. Absolutely, All and to get are out so of abusive marriages linked. or situations, right. because a lot of times the reason that women don't report or contact women protection centers, for example, mm. or file an FIR, is because they have nowhere else to go and they don't have that support from their. To family. add to that, also the stigma which surrounds it, Absolutely. because there's a lot of unfortunately victim blaming and victim shaming in our yeah. society. So these are the things that we definitely need to work upon. Yes. On which I'll come to you, and before we conclude today's show, Ms. Uma, so what is that advice that you would want to give to all the women out there who are are watching our show or who have in one way or the other been subjected to any kind of dowry abuse or dowry related violence, how is it that they can learn to say no to it? The way to learn uh, to say no to it is firstly the families need to be really understand that if somebody is 
at this stage is demanding all these things, it's not the right family for them. Right. Let's just start from these social training. And then secondly, even if the gifts are given in marriage, because I have cases in which they come later as divorce mm. and they don't even know how to prove how much, you know, because that mm. is a, an asset belonging to the woman in the right. marriage. So she cannot even uh, recover it back. Mm. So you should always keep lists with you, with receipts and everything, that this is what she's bought with her parents' mm. money and taken into the marriage and she was using it and she can take it back. Right. So that thing should be there. Secondly, mm. the most important thing is, uh, you know, educating that whether it's a girl or a boy, mm. education is priority, not the marriage. Right. Because people say, oh, we are saving up for her marriage. We are mm. saving up for her marriage. Why are you saving up for her marriage? Save up for her education. Mm. And the thing is, whether it's a girl or boy, they should not be dowry concept because they say, oh, we, the reason they say, oh, we've given so much dowry. How can we give her part of inheritance to exactly. or equal right into inheritance? Mm. Usually you just get the Sharia right, half of the brother. Right. But that's the minimum that you're required to give. Right. You can give more also. Mm. So I would advise that the parents give education to their daughters mm. and they just marry them as they marry their sons. And likewise and also then, educate the sons too. And they just they marry them just like because you they see, don't men need to. Needs both to be engaged. of them make mm. together a home and they buy things. Mm. Okay, you start up a couple, they, you help them mm. in getting things and you give them share in property equally because mm. you don't give them dowry. That doesn't make sense that mm. you give them everything on marriage hmm. or you because I furnished the whole house you don't need to furnish the whole right, house basically let it be the couple's job if you've educated them to earn to make it you hmm. just help the couple a little so that's very rightly put by uh. yourself so basically then in a nutshell the focus should then shift from focusing on the relationship rather than having material expectations yes. surrounding at it. the time of marriage at the yeah. time of marriage or and you know furnishing the house and all that all those I mean, which is completely unnecessary uh, because basically yes. on which I'll come to you Miss Rabia here we must also of course talk about the dire need to not only educate but also to sensitize men and their families too and in this regard we have seen that there has been this very interesting global movement by the name of white ribbon campaign the purpose of which was to actually engage men and to make them say no to gender-based violence or even dowry practices so can we not have similar practices here in Pakistan where we actively involve men and of course their family members too in awareness campaigns that we are running so as to very openly condemn such practices we have realized the issue and we are working on the prevention side of the domestic violence because people don't realize that GBV is such a massive issue that it has been declared as um, a public health disease. Prevention of violence is extremely important. Uh, domestic violence has been labeled as a public health disease uh, mm. by the UNFPA and other international mm. bodies. Right. So we need to address all segments of the society. Mm. Uh, we took initiatives, we had MOUs with the various universities right. and we requested the students to run mm. campaigns on awareness of uh, regarding domestic violence and drug addiction also. Uh, then we started a campaign, Aware to Empower, in which I went to uh, the juvenile prisons mm. and we went to uh, boys' schools mm. and we had uh, special campaigns and we took them on board and started internship programs for them right. so that they can come and see how this works and they need to be sensitized. Mm. And we also need to sensitize the service providers. We right. need help in sensitizing the judiciary, the women medical officers, mm. the police and the service providers who are working in these women protection centers. Right. Right, I was about the to training say that, competent huh? and the training component is extremely important of course because they need to upgrade themselves they need hmm. to learn they capacity need to building capacity is something which is very important of the law enforcement yes. and sensitization to the extent of the masses too yeah. which I'll come to you Ms. Meronisa here before we conclude today's show it's equally important that we also talk about the rights of immigrant Pakistani women because a lot of times we see that this is something which just doesn't then happen in Pakistan this is also something which then impacts uh, Pakistani women who are living in different countries abroad, be it UK, be it US, or for that matter, be it even Canada. So in this regard, what is it that women abroad, they can do so as to protect themselves from such evils? And not only that, what should be their first line of contact in terms of getting the right recourse? Because a lot of times we understand the fact that women don't even know in foreign countries who to reach out to for help. 
Um, I think the issue is also that um, often abroad in foreign countries, they are not so aware of the cultural practices that are normalized right. within expat communities. And the other thing is because racism, etc., and being culturally insensitive has mm -hmm. become such a big issue, they shy away from interfering in kind of, you know, people will say, oh, this is our religion, this right. is our culture. Mm -hmm. So they don't want to come across as insensitive, so mm -hmm. they often shy away from kind of interfering in that. We see this in domestic violence right. also. We had some Muslim community you know protesting in the no, UK. No, there have been so many cases. I remember this Pakistani Canadian man, he actually murdered his wife because yeah, yeah. and this became I, on the headline. I don't remember the name of that lady but she was murdered just because she didn't give in to the uh, dowry demands. Exactly. So I think what we need to do is we also need to target expat communities abroad in foreign countries and make sure that we are making those women literate and raising awareness amongst them also. So if a woman is facing pressure over there, right. or she's facing psychological, physical, emotional, uh, or mental abuse, mm. then she needs to make sure that she calls social protection and mm. she takes the necessary steps to protect herself. And we need to tell those expat communities it is our job to make them aware of remedies right. available in those jurisdictions as well. Mm. And just to add to something, very rightly, Huma said, when, when you are giving gifts um, to your daughters, etc., you keep receipts, but this is another area for reform. And Balochistan's done this and not done this very well. The law over there actually says it is if there's mm. A complaint that comes a uh, dowry related the onus is not on the woman to prove mm -hmm. that this was given to me it shifts so they've right. reversed the burden and they've the said it's the husband's shifts, job basically. or his mm -hmm. family's job to prove that these were not received mm -hmm. so those are small steps that we can take shifting the burden mm -hmm. um, on the accused party in uh, violence uh, women violence related crimes which makes it easier even in the prosecution of such crimes. Right, that's very rightly put by yourself but for that to happen at the end of the day I think it's very important that we change the societal mindset. Absolutely. This is a problem Absolutely. which emanates from the society so Absolutely. the solutions naturally should be attributed to the because society. Because unless society too. and their exactly. uh, mindset changes you can have all the laws you want but right. you, you will have no but one. But people would have no will to implement this. Absolutely. Same. So the, basically then the solutions need to emanate from the society yes. on which note I would want to conclude today's show. Thank you so much Ms. Oma, thank you so much Ms. Rabia Ms. and thank you so much Ms. Meronissa for thank your time you so today. Much. Well to conclude today's show we generally spoke about this prevalent social menace of dowry and dowry related abuse as it does exist in the Pakistani society. We also spoke about the laws and policies as they do exist in Pakistan so as to curtail it, so as to criminalize it. What we do need to ensure is the fact that you know these laws and policies of course they are implemented in letter and in spirit. What we do need to ensure is also to make sure of the fact that you know all kinds of support and rehabilitative services are provided timely to survivors of violence and what we do need to ensure is of course the fact that we need to understand the fact that dowry at a very basic level is not only a social menace which directly impacts the girls and their families it is unfortunately that one societal disease which impacts or for that matter plagues the entire society on that note signing off for today until next time take care and Allah Hafiz